another episode of Career Exploration Saturday. I'm your host, Ebony Tyler. I have real conversations with real people about real jobs. So happy Juneteenth. I told you I'd be back in June. So here I am. I know it has been a minute. All right. So this week, my guest is Keisha Walker, entrepreneur, marketing executive, and all around dope human. We talk about her experience in Russia as a teen, her love for HBCUs, and why she founded Black Collegiate Gaming Association. All right. Let's jump right in. Good afternoon and welcome, Keisha. Welcome to Career Exploration Saturday. I am so glad to have you here today. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. So, you know, we start all the conversations, you know, tell us who 16-year-old Keisha was. Did she have it all together? Did she know what she wanted to be when she grew up? Absolutely. And actually what I wanted to do and be is very different than who I am now. So I think the first thing to tell 16-year-olds is, be open to change, uh, be open to adjust, but more importantly, be happy for whatever you do. Do what you want to do, not what your parents, your grandparents or guardians or teachers or coaches or anybody else is telling you to do. Do what makes you happy and what you find that it drives and excites you when you wake up in the morning and then figure out a way to monetize that and make money off of it, regardless of what that is, because there's always a way to make money off of just about anything. So uh, think about and do that. And so at 16, I actually was um, pretty much raising myself. My great grandmother passed. I was uh, had just graduated from high school um, and was trying to figure out and was actually um, about to start or had started uh, early admissions into college and was also about to head to um, Russia and Hawaii for some international delegation programs. Um, so I had a chance to go international at a very young age. At that time, too, I wanted to be the first Black female Supreme Court justice. Um, I had been uh, doing mock courts and um, practicing law in high school, and we were competing and winning at the high school level. Uh, we were first at, for all three years, my, myself and my business partner, and we were one of the few Black female uh, partners that were actually competing the ent entire time we were in high school. Um, and so I, I definitely knew then I wanted to be successful. I was also doing events on the side. Um, my, you know, my mom used to do sampling for uh, Coca-Cola and she had a chance to work with Pepsi and because it was a, a conflict, she had me help her and I started doing Pepsi sampling and hiring my friends to do Pepsi sampling. And back then Kmart was open. So we were doing uh, Kmart stores uh, back in Alabama where I went to high school. Um, and so uh, I, I was an entrepreneur. And then you know, in the, during Thanksgiving and Christmas, we would do these events, parties, and would bring all the high schools together in, in, in Montgomery um, during the, the, the holiday season. And I did that all the way through college. So we would come back home every year uh, you know, through, during the holidays and we, we would do parties and everybody would come back from college or folks who worked, went to school at home and we all would have you know, big Thanksgiving and Christmas uh, celebrations. So I, I made money that way too. Um, and I worked in a balloon store. So I did a lot because um, <laughs> I had to, you know, I, I had to take care of myself, uh, my mom, was a single mom and she had my brother and, uh, you know, and, and they, you know, and she was working a couple of jobs and I, I wanted to have and do nice things. So I knew I had to work myself to raise that money to do that. I also knew I wanted to go to college. So I was like, I've got to stay busy, raise money, save money to go to college. And so uh, my 16 year old self uh, was nonstop to say the least. Um, so I like, I like the fact that you are entrepreneur from day one and you, you, you started this conversation with some advice for our young people. So that is super awesome. So what happened next? Did you, um, go straight off to college or, or, or tell us a little bit about that experience in Russia? Cause what's a black woman doing in Russia? Wow. Uh, it was unbelievable. And what I will tell you is this, I came back to the United States with a, a, a greater appreciation for our freedom. Uh, because, you know, while I was there, I met, you know, families, because uh, we went to Moscow and Leningrad, but I met families um, who did not have a choice on if their kids could go to college or not. You were basically put into a, 
I, I hate to use the word caste system, but I, I can't think of another word to describe it. Um, and, and you basically, your, your life was dictated, you and your families and even the generations before and after you of what they would do. So you were either working class, you know, or you were the educated class or you were the rich and you fell into one of those three categories. Um, you know, and then Christianity, you know, people, you know, one of the families, the husband went to, to prison for teaching people the Bible, you know, in Russia, mm. you know, and then, uh, like I said, it was uh, one of the young, one of the families we met with and stayed with, amazingly talented, smart young man, but he said he would never get a chance to go to college because his family was a working class and they worked. You don't get to go and get educated and go to a university um, unless they figured out a way to leave the country. Um, and we stayed in the hotels, you know, they checked our, they checked our luggage, they checked our bags every day. Um, you know, they confiscated my blue jeans because there's there were, and they claimed that it was, you know, they weren't supposed to be brought in from the United States, but those were commodities in Russia. So I, they literally just stole it, but they used the word confiscated to make it legal to do so. Uh, they took our film, our photos, because they did not want us to come back. Cause I mean, it was still true communism uh, then. Uh, but we were there with the Lions International. And so that organization is respected in, in Russia. So we were protected. Um, but I remember two standing in line one day for six hours to get cheese and bread and milk um, because it wasn't sold in the stores in the community that we were in. And you had to wait in long lines to get to get hand, basically a handout. Um, and then they would run out sometimes. And then you would have no milk, cheese or bread. And imagine a family not having milk, cheese and bread for weeks at a time. You know, so it really gave me a respect for the luxuries that we have here in the United States, because even when you can't afford it, you're able to go into a lot of food pantries, kitchens, you know, then it was food stamps. Now we've got these EBT cards, but you have a chance to still be able to get the, you know, the, 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 the staples that you need for food in life. You know, you can go to church, you don't have to worry about being prosecuted for what religion you celebrate. You don't have to worry about people going into your luggage and bags and your hotel rooms and confiscating, you know, your items. Uh, you're not followed and, you know, constantly checked. So, um, it was an amazing experience and something I would definitely recommend students that they have a chance to go after and go and look at visit places first and foremost outside of where you live. Step outside your state, get on an airplane, um, and then beyond that, get a passport uh, and go travel outside the United States. You can see the world that is outside the U.S. We are not the end all, nor will we ever be, and there's a lot of different cultures and opportunities that, that exist outside the United States. And if you have an opportunity, you know, whether it's through the military, getting a job, you know, go and see the world. Just let that rest right there. So I see you rep repping at HBCU. Did you go? Did you go off to college? Um, where'd you go? Absolutely. So I actually started off at the University of Alabama. I went on a New York Times scholarship. I also wanted to be in addition to, well, I was going to go start off in journalism and then go to law school after uh, I got my broadcast journalism degree. And I was going to become, like I said, the first black female Supreme Court justice. So I actually went to Alabama. I started in high school, my senior year, second half of my senior year. I started at Alabama. Then I went that summer and then I went my entire freshman year. I had planned to go to Florida a University. Um, I saw this article in Ebony Magazine about the black Harvard. Uh, and, you know, I, I wanted to go to Harvard um, and had been accepted. But one of my good friends who was a year older than me had a nervous breakdown and came home. And so my mom said, you're not going to Harvard. I'm not putting you through that. So I was like, okay, I've got to find somewhere else super to go because that was one of the few, one of three schools I applied for, uh, Florida and then being the other one. And then when I saw the article about the Black Harvard, I was like, oh, I'm definitely going to the right place. But I got down there. There was a housing conflict. This is my first true freshman year. Um, and there was a conflict with my housing. There was already three women in the room. My mom said no to staying off campus as a freshman in a state where we don't have any family. Um, and so uh, we, uh, I, she told me I had to come back. So I went to Alabama my full freshman year. I stayed in touch with the dean of a business school, um, God rest her soul, Dean uh, Sybil Mobley. And I actually transferred back to FAMU. I'm one of the few transfers she allowed to come back to our School of Business and Industry. Um, and so best decision I could have made was going to an HBCU. Um, I tell anybody, and I had the chance to see both the PWI, predominantly white institution side at the University of Alabama, as well as the HBCU side. I, I went to both. And hands down for a black African-American, I will tell you, go to an HBCU, at least just for your undergraduate degree. You can go to a PWI, a predominantly white institution for your master's, your PhDs, your doctorates, or whatever else you want to get. But HBCUs provide you the foundation and the base that will take you through the rest of your lives. The people you meet, the networking, the Black professors that motivate you, you know, tell you what you can be, what you can do. You know, when I was in Alabama, they tried to tell me I couldn't have a double major in broadcast journalism and business. They wanted me to go into 
uh, physical education or teaching. And I was an athlete in, in high school, you know, um, and I'm like, no, I'm going to do business. I already have been owning business already in high school. So I'm, I'm definitely going to own more business as I, you know, as I, as I continue to, to grow. I was like, so I'm getting a business degree and I want to be a journalist and I'm going to be a lawyer. So, you know, I had the, all three of those plans. But the fact that the counselors at Alabama tried to turn me in a different direction because of what they thought I couldn't do and achieve. And looking at my GPA and all that I had, the, the honors, I don't know how they even questioned me being able to do a double major. Um, but I said that to say how many other Blacks are having those conversations and being deterred by people who are professors and or, you know, guidance counselors, academic counselors. And then they're changing the majors and dreams that they want to pursue because somebody told them, well, I don't know if you could do that or you'd probably be better doing this. So you know, at HBCUs, you don't have that challenge. They push you on what you want to do and help you to achieve that and go even beyond that. You know, and then you find, like I said, you meet other great African-Americans and you network and form relationships. I still talk to most of the people I met in some form or another, you know, through college and now with social media, which we didn't have when I was <laughs> in college. It's even easier to stay in touch with people all over the world that we went to college with. You know, and so I, I recommend hands down, I'm, I'm a proud, proud two-time graduate of Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, FAMU. Um, I got both my business, my Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, and I went back and got my MBA in marketing uh, from Florida AM. And again, I would best decision I could have ever made and would do it all over again if I had the chance. Look, I am smiling and beaming like if you is a member of my family and did all of that because I absolutely love HBCUs and I think that parents don't understand that the guidance counselors, the teachers, they are gatekeepers to who your what to your child's future. And if exactly. we don't put this information in front of them, if we don't tell them, you got somebody else stopping your kid and stopping your generational wealth because of what they think your kid is capable of. Absolutely, and you wanna go somewhere where everybody looks like you, understands you, and, and, and can help you. So you know, HBCUs is a, to me a non-brainer. Non no -brainer. And my entire family went to HBCUs. You know, my dad went to Alabama State University, my brother and sister. I have a sister went to Alabama a and University. I have another brother went to Florida a and with me. You know, I, I, my, um, I have a, a, my, I call it my mom too, my second mom. She went to Mississippi Valley State University. And then she got her PhD at Alabama State University. And so our whole family is all about HBCUs. My adopted brother went to Dillard. You know, so we, you know, so it's so much history and success out of our HBCUs. And, you know, they were there for us when we weren't able to go to white schools. You know, I tell people, I'm like, so why not go to where, who started it, where you were able to get educated from day one? You didn't have to beg, didn't have to ask, didn't have to be protected and walked, escorted into our colleges. They've been there since the beginning and they've been educating more PhDs and masters and undergraduate blacks than all the PWIs combined. And there's only 104 HBCUs right now. So that tells you the power of our HBCUs. And right. again, parents find one, figure it and, and research it and find and find and we've got the, you can get all kinds of majors and degrees. So find out what your student wants to do in terms of majors and then start researching the best HBCU and make it happen. Um, everybody's all surrounding loving HBCUs now. And if there's no other time to make a decision to go to HBC, if you didn't already know, it's definitely the time to do so now. So you graduated, you got a bachelor's degree, you got an MBA, and, and what did you do with those? I worked uh, at Proc, I spent nine and a half years in brand management at Procter & Gamble, uh, who makes, you know, Tide and Crest and Pringles and some of the other uh, major brands that people are familiar with. Uh, I worked at Coca-Cola and uh, was responsible for the Friendlies, which is a Northeastern brand, Perkins, Country Kitchen, uh, TGI Fridays, and the uh, Radisson Hotel accounts, and also worked with Sodexo. Um, that worked at Amico Oil Company, where I was working the credit card marketing group. And then we also helped um, create the conversion of a couple of the um, gas stations they acquired around the country. Um, and so, and then I did a brief stint at Bell South Mobility, uh, where we, I worked in wireless. And we launched, uh, we, we helped them change or transfer their uh, landline customers to wireless services. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time in market and launched a leave, uh, which is a pain reliever at Procter & Gamble, is now owned by Bayer, uh, but spent a lot of time in brand management and marketing where I did, uh, as a Black person, you was the only Black person on the business, I was responsible for the multicultural 
uh, promotions, marketing. So anything that went to Asian, Black, and or Hispanic uh, consumers and individuals, I worked on those campaigns, programs, promotions, and projects uh, for those companies and brands. And so phenomenal work experience. But I started my own company at um, Procter & Gamble. And the first company was called Instill We Rise Productions. And, you know, and then I, I had that company for four years. Then I moved to, um, I had it the first year I moved to Atlanta after I left p and And I brought some clients that I had there with me to Atlanta. Um, and like I said, a quick stint at Bell South Mobility and then went to Coca-Cola and actually started a different company, which is a company I have now uh, for the past 22 years, Insights Marketing. Um, we did events, uh, in-store promotions where you see people giving out samples. Uh, we gave out coupons. Uh, you know, when you see people giving out stuff outside of venues and gifts, now it's called experiential marketing. Uh, back then it was called sampling uh, and in-store promotions. And so we did that. Uh, and we did that while I was working full-time at Coke. So again, I've always been a believer that there's 24 hours in every day. Um, and you can be an entrepreneur and work full-time in corporate America. Uh, you could do both if you want, or you could do either or, uh, but do something. Uh, you know, sitting at home, and trying to figure it out is not an option. <laughs> Again, if you know what you love and what you want to do, my mom always said you'll never work a day in your life. Uh, but figure out what you love and then figure out how to monetize it. Whether that's in a corporate job working for somebody else or doing it yourself, get it done. So I want to talk a little bit about the marketing and um, brand management and being a person of color and how important it is to have us in those rooms, you know, behind. Um, advertising. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why that's important and a little bit deeper about um, exactly what brand management is and how do you market to um, communities of color? Yeah, so brand management is everything that goes on behind the scenes of what you purchase, um, whether it's a, a, a tangible, something you can touch, or an intangible a service item. Uh, there's a brand team behind it. To help you to help you want to purchase or use that product or service. And so you know we we are responsible for creating the sales campaigns, the promotional campaigns, the the commercials, radio, com the radio commercials, the billboards, TV ads, magazines, print, anything you see uh, that helps you to understand the brand, that's what the brand management team team does. And we're broken up into, uh, into functions or sections, and we each have responsibilities based on that. And so, again, I, you know, I, I normally, in most cases, had the multicultural responsibility to make sure that Black, Brown people were purchasing the product, was gaining awareness to the product, and what we call a trial, which is the action of you actually purchasing the product. So we're responsible for that in brand management. We we help you know that the product exists. Uh, we help encourage you to want to purchase the product. And then our end result and our number one goal is to get you to actually buy that product or service. So we gain revenue for our companies that we work for every day. Got it. Thank you. So, you know, not only are you the, um, the president of Insights Marketing and Promotions, but the founder and the chairwoman of the Black Collegiate Gaming Association. What is yeah. that? Why'd you start it? And, and who's your target audience? Tell us all about that, that organization. Yes, yeah, so I actually created the organization, association, in May of 2020. Uh, it, it was created because my nephew, who is 11, wants to be a professional gamer, and he also wants to get a degree in esports and gaming. And so he, uh, at his surprise birthday party last year, we were trying to, he wouldn't, didn't want to come out of his room because he was gaming. My sister said, go talk to him. He's always playing video games when he's not in, you know, some virtual school. And so he started explaining to me that, you know, he started showing me the players, the professional gamers that he idolizes and the schools where he wants to attend to major in and play on their esports teams and to get a degree in esports. And as he was showing them to me, there were no HBCUs. There were three PWI schools and the professional gamers he showed me, nobody was black and there were no females. It was like nine white guys and an Asian guy. And I'm like, Jackson, you don't see something wrong with this picture? Look at you, look at me. I don't see any of that and, and, and the things that you're following, watching and what you wanna do. Uh, I don't have any problems with going to PWI, but as a full family of HBCU, proud HBCU graduates, we need you to have at least the HBCU on that list of schools. And he was like, well, Auntie Keisha, there are no HBCUs that have degrees or offer scholarships, have esports teams, so I can't go to an HBCU. 
And I said, no, that's, that can't be right. We've got 104 HBCUs in the country. Somebody's giving a degree out. Somebody's got esports teams and giving out scholarships. And he started showing me on Google. And uh, sure enough, outside of Kentucky State University, there are no other HBCUs offering degrees up until last fall. Um, and, and now, and they officially haven't started until the spring, John C. Smith, with the minor degree that they're offering and a certificate in esports and gaming. Mm-hmm. And so I told myself, I'm going to go back to Atlanta and figure out how to change that for you. Because when you're old enough, I want you to have an HBCU as an option. I want you to be able to go there, uh, get a degree, play on their team, get a, you know, get a scholarship, and do whatever else you want to at HBCUs. And I also want there to be some brown people on this professional gaming list of gamers that are making all this money in the industry. And so I, that was May 14th. We started BCGA the following week. George Floyd was killed the week after that. And, and once George was killed, I said, you know what? This is my aha moment. I've got to take the reins and go into seventh gear to make this happen. Because I started, when we were redoing the research and look at the numbers, you know, less than 3% of the industry, the people that work in the industry are black. But we account for 70% of the students between ages of 13 and 24 that game. So we're playing a game. We're spending money on the gaming systems, the gaming PCs, the accessories, the video games. But we're not responsible for making the decisions that for all of those equipment, all the hardware, software, accessories, and games that we're, that our, our youth are using. And so we've got to diversify that space. Uh, and, and so we're, we created BCGA to do that. So BC- I am the first Black woman in the history of the world to ho- own a collegiate esports and gaming company. So I'm excited about making history. I hate the fact that it took, until, thank you. I hate the fact it took until 2020 20 to do it, but hey, my mom always says better late than never. So uh, we are on a fast paced, fast track mission to bring more blacks, get more people that look like us access to this unbelievably industry that's going to reach probably a hundred billion dollars by the end of the year. So there's money to be made, there's jobs to be gained. <laughs> gainfully employed and we need to know about those and start getting ourselves in the position through education and work experience to take on those opportunities so your target is hbcu students and black collegiate students is that correct and women of color so me as as and i you know it's a full circle moment for me i started playing video games 35 years ago with atari and and the, the original atari and xbox you know, so to be able to be back in this space now and being able to help young people that were my age when I started to get into the industry and to start learning the industry and space, um, it's just it, literally it's a full circle moment. Now, what exactly do you do with young people? How do you prepare them for this space? Yeah, so we're focused right now uh, 100% on college students, black college students and women of color college students, whether in a, whether they're attending a community college, a PWI predominantly white institution, a PBI, predominantly brown institution, or one of our HBCUs, you know, we're, we're going after those individuals uh, through some properties like Black College Con that took place last month during Black History Month. We've got Women Got Game that comes up next weekend. Um, and both those properties help to get students access to individuals that look like us in the industry that are success stories. It helps connect them to internship and job opportunities. It helps to give them a chance to meet, network with those individuals in some many smaller breakout sessions to understand where and how and why they got into the industry and hopefully create some un- informal mentoring opportunities for students to see and, and meet and under, you know, connect with those success stories. And then we have events like, uh, you know, uh, Corners to College, which will come up in the fall, which will help our high school students understand that you can use esports and gaming um, as an opportunity to make money. Uh, you know, through professional play, because at 15, you can become a professional gamer and start making money, professional gaming. Um, and then, you know, you can get a degree, uh, go to school and uh, get educated, get a degree and then work 15 or 20 years in the industry. Um, so, and then we also have more, uh, we have an, another event called Military Play, which is going to target uh, active and duty and, and veterans. Thank you so much, Keisha. So some takeaways are be open to change, be happy, find what drives you, and think about how to monetize it. Two, go to an HBCU for undergrad. HBCUs provide you with the foundation for the rest of your life, the friends, the networks, the bonds you make. It's unlike any experience. 
And three, gaming is a billion dollar industry and we need to be in that space and we can get there through education and work experience. Follow Keisha and her work on the socials, Twitter, IG, Twitch, Facebook at BCGUSA. Thank you so much, Keisha, and welcome to the Liberated Success family. Listen, folks, your girl's been working, okay? And actually, your girl has fully put in her resignation from her full-time job and it's going Full steam ahead with liberated success. And let me tell you, this would not be possible without your donations to 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 fund, found <laughs> to found to create um an, an organization um solely based off of donations has put me in an amazing place to be able to do this work full time. And I am tremendously thankful um to my family, to my close friends, to my network, to my tribe, to everyone who has supported me over this last year and this journey when I decided to create Liberated Success. And now um I'm gonna be able to do it full time and it's and I'm so grateful. Um to all of your donations um, to make Liberated Success um, a nonprofit and for us to be able to work with young people. Um, So we had our first cohort of kids. They were amazing and um, they got your money. Like we gave them the money that you donated to us to be able to um, do a first cohort of Liberated Problem Solvers. Um, We got another cohort coming up in the summer. Um, so that's super exciting. Um, we got a grant, um, a fellowship that I'm going to be a part of that's giving us um, money to do um, another cohort in the fall. Um, we are working with an, uh, an organization, a really fancy schmancy organization designing a program um, for them. And, you know, like that would not have been possible without the Liberated Success community. So I'm just super grateful to everyone um, who has supported me in this journey um, to where we are now. Um, You know, it takes a village. Um, So I say all of that to say that if you um, find our work important, impactful, um, informative, please continue to um, keep Liberated Success in your tides, in your um, in your thoughts, in your wallet, um, and give us a donation because um, most of our work is supported by um, grassroots donations from um, our community. We have to take care of ourselves. All right, so. You know where the donation links are. They are in my bio on IG, Twitter, and YouTube. It's the first comment on Facebook. If you're listening on the podcast, you can make donations via listener support. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on IG, Facebook, and Twitter. And listen, now that you know my time is free, I will be able to provide you with um, more updates, more information, more content. So make sure you follow us. Um, make sure that you reach out. If you have any questions, you can always reach me at um, info at liberatedsuccess.net. And, um, you know, we still in a panorama, um, despite what everyone says. So make sure you wear your mask, wash your hands, um, physically distance. You know, vaccinations are a personal decision. Um, but, you know, I'm back because I'm trying to get back out here. Um, and all Black Lives Matter. Um, and I hope to see you next week. You know, I hope to be <laughs> able to get it together um, to get on here and put together a- another video. Um, but... Uh, I'm a one woman show and uh, I've been busy. All right. Enjoy your Saturday. Happy Juneteenth, y'all. All right. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.